So I'd like to introduce you to Danny Smith. Uh, Danny Smith is part of our AWS uh, organization uh, in the ML space. Danny is also part of the auto manufacturing group. And uh, with that, Danny, I will hand it over to you to uh, present on generative AI. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, everyone. Nice to be here. Uh, uh, so good morning and uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Yeah, all good. Um, so uh, first of all, <laughs> great presentations from my, uh, uh, you know, from from my the predecessors uh, on the on the menu uh, on the agenda today. Um, and uh, I love seeing the democratize the democratization of technology, uh, and that uh, includes especially uh, machine learning. I'm a principal strategist uh, covering artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in the auto and manufacturing sectors globally. Uh, and so one of my passions is about democratizing AI and ML technologies uh, to be able to make better decisions. And so, um, and especially better business decisions, byline of business. And so one of the more interesting technologies that uh, we see uh, emerging over the last uh, eight months, or at least gaining visibility into the public uh, sphere in the last uh, six, six, eight months is generative AI. And so uh, we thought it might be interesting to kind of give you an update on some of the use cases within uh, manufacturing industries, um, uh, popular architecture options, um, and then other learnings to date. So I'll just dive right in. So um, there's no doubt that uh, everybody is interested, um, and there's a lot of uh, studies that uh, show that uh, you know people have um, you know survey results that say this is going to be a game-changing technology. Um, interestingly, not everybody agrees on how that works because uh, we're early days yet. But um, I think this is uh, not a surprise that all of you probably. Your CEOs probably are hearing about this or have played with uh, technologies in the consumer side, um, and uh, maybe dangerously so. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, so there's a lot of exposure, right? Uh, so I think though, if we kind of peel back a little bit and say, okay, where are we adding value in general across all industries? We see generative AI being, um, you know, very uh, interesting in terms of helping people develop new experiences, um, productivity gains, new insights, creativity, et cetera. But I'd like to kind of focus on manufacturing. And so um, as manufacturers, we're always interested in, you know, uh, improving efficiencies and productivities. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you take a step back, I've always been, uh, I was well mentored uh, when I was uh, young in my career. Um, and uh, one of my mentors said, it's always better to help the profit center versus the cost center. And so uh, the two concepts there are, if you can help grow revenues, that's fantastic. Um, but, you know, saving money is not bad either. And so if we focus on these areas in manufacturing, we see generative AI showing up in some interesting areas, right? Um, th places we haven't actually seen uh, large growth using uh, AI and ML technologies, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we see things like uh, generative AI assisting legal teams, right, in reviewing documents, um, or um, product designers uh, uh, generating new designs. Um, we see, um, uh, you know, generative AI accelerating the understanding of root cause analysis, and we'll talk more about these in just a moment. Um, so there's all kind of interesting opportunities, and I want to I want to pull your attention. And um, as previously stated, you'll get these slides, uh, and so you can get the link easily. But there was a, a very good study that recently came out from the Manufacturing Leadership Council, um, a group I had uh, the privilege to spend about six years with um, uh, as a member uh, in the past. And their um, study is on uh, the future of AI in manufacturing, and it came out recently, came out in June. And there's good reading and good insights across all of this. But one of the things they called out was there are particular functions within manufacturing 
that haven't really embraced the technology. And so if you think about it, it's fertile ground, uh, uh, you know, to kind of uh, to look for improvements from this technology. And so places like procurement or legal or human resources um, are areas that have been underserved so far. And so a lot of these line of businesses look to generative AI as a way to kind of um, you know, reap the benefits in ways that they haven't been able to do before. And so just some overall, you know, kind of examples that we see in active uh, projects is there's definitely generate, you know, gen uh, text uh, summarization and um, assistance, uh, both internally and uh, for external use, um, uh, assistance for research, summarization of information. Uh, whether it's uh, text or things in like knowledge graphs. Um, we see um, uh, one of the more interesting use cases I'm going to spend a little bit of time on is we see it is in software development, right? And how um, you can accelerate code um, by using code generation features of generative AI. So there's a lot of use cases. Now, if we kind of look at some of the big strategic workloads that um, the automotive and manufacturing industries kind of um, focus their attention on, right? So there's, uh, in, in these days, you know, most of us are software companies, whether we want to be or not, or whether we traditionally look at ourselves as a software company or not. So, you know, the software defined product, if you will, um, smart operations, the customer experience, the engineering experience, right? If you look at, use cases across this lens, you start to see some real, um, you know, trends. Um, and I look at, I, I classify things as art of probable and art of possible. I'm a pretty pragmatic person. And so I like to focus on things that are probable that we're going to get great value on, or, or it's a more mature use of the technology. And so if you take a look at that versus the kind of generative AI um, models that are out there, you see some emerging trends. So um, and so there's two, there's two um, big, big trends that I would say is the first of all is, you know, coding assistance, which I want to talk about, you see across multiple areas. And then the other uh, thing you see is these uh, the idea of interactive documents. So let's talk about those in more detail. So um, I'll highlight uh, again, you'll get the presentation so you don't have to try to jot down this um, report, but there's a, there's a recent McKinsey report that talks about the value of using coding assistance um, to accelerate innovation. And so it's an interesting report. I'd highly recommend you read it. Um, one of the things they call out is it really can increase developer speed um, more so with simple tasks than complex. But I just want to point out that the document, you know, that the screenshot I have uh, visible here is it says that. Um, there's a 10% improvement in coding speed with complex tasks, high complexity tasks. If you gave me a 10% improvement in, you know, uh, any coding, I would love it. Uh, but if you give me a 45 or 50% uh, improvement in some areas, I would love it anymore. And so if you're in a development role, you need to take a look at coding assistance like Amazon's Code Whisperer, uh, which I'll kind of talk about in a second. So the other, the other uh, really common use case, um, uh, internal use case, uh, as well as an external use case, um, is these what I call interactive documents. And so um, I was at Hanover Mesa a few months ago. This is the world's largest industrial conference in, in Hanover every year. Uh, 200,000 um, attendees, not including the, you know, the uh, vendors uh, who um, had display booths and stuff. So that's almost up to its, its record size uh, from a few years before the pandemic, 225, 250,000. So uh, manufacturing in-person conferences seem to be back, at least with Hanover Mesa. So that's good news. Um, so I talked to 84 customers when I was there and I asked all of them, and these are VPs of production, you know, heads of engineering, heads of uh, quality and maintenance, um, advanced manufacturing groups. I, I said, you know, what do you think of Gen AI? Interestingly, all of them said, I'm not sure we can use it yet because of our of legal issues. Talk about that in a second. 
I said, but if you could, how do you see this as valuable? And so what was interesting is they saw it as an efficiency improvement mechanism, but they also saw it as a way to close something that we commonly refer to in manufacturing as the manufacturing skills gap. And so what the skills gap means is, is um, I'll show you an example. So there's a, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers in the U.S., which is a, a group, it's like a conglomerate group of all manufacturing associations. And this is the primary lobbying arm of the industry within the U.S. And as such, there's a lot of non-U.S. members from Europe and Asia. Um, so they do a CEO survey every quarter, and they've done it for years. And so without fail over the last, I don't know, as long as I've been paying attention to this, the number one business challenge that the CEO identifies is attracting and retaining a quality workforce, right? And so when we look at, um, you know, if we think about this and, and say, okay, so it's not just um, attracting, uh, you know, and retaining, but it's also having the quality workforce, right? Are, are they trained? And so this is where the skills gap is. And so as an example, in the U.S. market, uh, there's an estimated 2.3, I think, million more jobs than there are skilled candidates applying. Um, and so I think this is going to continue. And, and so the, the, the way the conversation um, at Hanover Mesa came was, um, hey, I've got 30-year veterans who are uh, about to retire, and they have a world of good institutional knowledge in their heads, and we have that institutional knowledge captured in things like standard operating procedures, or work instructions, or repair manuals, or installation guides. I said, but the next generation actually didn't even come into our industry. But the generation after that came in, but they grew up on smartphones. And so is there an easier way for us to allow them to find the information they need when they need it in a way that's easy for them to understand? Because that generation is not interested in reading a thousand page standard operating procedure manual. And so there's another survey that I'll uh, point you to, which has interesting results um, from um, our uh, one of our partner community, IBM, and they found that, you know, there's actually in their survey, they found that um, one in four companies actually were looking at adopting AI in particular to help close the skills gap or the, or the labor shortage gaps. Um, and so um, that I thought that was interesting based on the conversations that I had with Han at Hanover Mesa. Um, so there's one there's uh i'm going to go back to the manufacturing leadership council study for a minute and, and they you know they ask questions what what's your biggest uh, challenge and so data was identified as biggest challenge but here's what's interesting and here's how it relates to the skills gap and the the power of generative ai is that you know what's the what's the problem with data specifically and there's a number of things identified here but i'm going to highlight that contextualization is the biggest challenge. And so this is something that generative AI technologies, large language models do particularly well as they help contextualize the data for a human. And so I'll just use an example from my own life, right? And, and so this is um, this document, which I have the code for, you can go take a look at it, it's on the internet. Um, it is a diagnostic uh, code uh, documentation, it's like 150 pages, and it has diagnostic codes that come off of an internal combustion engine powertrain, right? And so I don't know if you've had experiences with cars that break down, but um, there's a device you can plug into the CAN bus and you can see which codes were tripped. This helps with root cause analysis. However, it's a 150 page manual just for the powertrain. So it's not necessarily easy to understand um, and figure out root cause or diagnose, right? And so real world example, my daughter it was in high school at the time. She just graduated from college. So uh, she successfully passed the final exam uh, in high school. But during, during her drive to school to take her final exam, her car broke down 
She left it on the side of the road. She sent me a text message and said, the car broke down. I left it. I'm on to school. So luckily I was able to find the car. And of course I had one of those devices. I plugged the device in and I get fault codes and they were P11, P12 and P16 fault codes. And so I actually started, you know, months and months ago, started testing out Gen AI capabilities to help understand if it could be useful uh, in this situation, right? And so if you take a peek at the manual, right, here's some of the results I got. And so I just ask common sense questions like, you know, what a, you know, and I'm looking at my larger monitor here, right? So what are, what are these fault code her errors have in common? And they give good answers, right? And so what's interesting is like other things, uh, you know, from an internet search perspective, if you draw the parallel, you start asking different questions based on the information you see. And so you can have an interactive conversation with these documents and the information is summarized and concise and, and accurate. Um, so you can learn, you can do root cause, you can make better decisions, you can understand uh, you know what it needs and so this is just one use case that's popular across all manufacturers and so if you haven't started looking at this already um, I'd encourage you to do so and, and happy to kind of help uh, help you think about things so the most common question that I get is how does it really work which we do not have time to talk about today um, but what we can talk about today is how can I make sure it provides good answers Right, because manufacturing, we are uh, a fact-based uh, industry, right? We need to make sure that when somebody asks about these fault codes, as an example, we get good responses, right? And so there are different techniques that we can use for improving generative AI's ability to respond factually. Because one of the things about generative AI, so generative means it can make stuff up, which means it can make stuff up. And so sometimes making stuff up is referred to as lying, right? And so we need to make sure that if we need a fact-based answer, we get it. And so how do we do that? So there's lots of techniques. You've probably heard of some of them by now. So one of them is prompt engineering, right? And so prompt engineering is something like this. Like, what's a prompt? Well, the prompt is just the question you're asking. When can I have a meeting? Now, if you think about that, that's not a good question, right? So a better question would be, hey, when can I have a meeting referring to you know, my calendar or my coworker's calendar and looking at these specific time slots? Now, when I say referring to, you need to help the generative AI large language model in this case, refer to this document. And the way we do this is a technique called retrieval augmented generation. So this is a very common architecture uh, to instill better responses uh, in the large language model. And so we'll talk about it um, in more detail in just a minute. So there's also other ways. So you could continue to fine tune, which is continue to train a model if you, if you have one and have access to its uh, intellectual property. And then you could also build your own, right? And so you can build a foundation model. Uh, it's another uh, technical term for this generative AI models. Um, and so, if you think about it, though, there's this uh, level of complexity and expense that, um, you know, increases as you go down this list, right? So maybe we should uh, have that uh, arrow reversed. Um, so, uh, you know, so what you want to do is see if you can get a good answer for, for um, the least amount of money, right? Same as any manufacturing process. So let's talk about retrieval augmented generation just a little bit. And so let's take this interactive manual kind of concept, right? So we have a user and he asks a question and, and you know, the first thing that happens is he, he interfaces with a chatbot. And so behind the scenes, the chatbot has an agent mechanism, which is like action and response, action response, right? So agent mechanisms, and there are, there are several, there's, you know, publicly available libraries like Langchain is popular. Um, we have an agent mechanism within our um, bedrock AI service for generative AI. Um, so this agent mechanism, what it does is it takes on the role of saying, oh, okay, you have a question about this topic. Let's go search 
for uh, existing data sources right within your organization that are relevant to this and then that relevant data is passed back and then the agent then sends that data source and your question to the large language model in this case. And it basically says, hey, large language model, answer the question after you've read these documents, right? And so when the large language model responds, you get a better answer. And so not to review this now, but there's an excellent article on Medium that walks through some of the um, architectural options that you have available to you for the agent for search mechanisms, um, you can use many, and of course talks about you know large language models as well. Um, so please refer to this later on when you get the presentation. Um, and there's also lots of blogs on this topic. And so here's an example that you can take a look at that uses our own smart search capability in Kendra, Amazon Kendra, uh, to be able to augment um, a large language model. Now. Um, if there, if you need to, and if there's interest, um, you can continue to fine tune uh, a model that you have or to build your own. And so there are great examples um, out there. Um, there's, there's few manufacturing examples, but I want to highlight one that everybody can relate to that's not in manufacturing, and this is Bloomberg. And so most people know Bloomberg, right? If you look at a like a stock trader's desk that he has like 15 monitors and about 12 of them have Bloomberg data feeds, right? So Bloomberg has an amazing 40, 50 year history of interesting financial data and market data available to them. So a rich intellectual property, um, which um, I'm sure they're, you know, continue to be interested in monetizing. And so what they did was they took an open, uh, open source model and they continued to train it on their own data. And now they have Bloomberg GPT. And they did this uh, using Amazon SageMaker. So you can read up the details on both the announcement of the product as well as how they did it and why they chose SageMaker to build the model on um, with those links. So I spend a lot of time talking to customers, I mean, expect, especially their um, executive leadership around uh, generative AI. And so they asked me, well, what have you learned so far? What should we be paying attention to? So let me review some of these things. So the one thing is, is what I would say is, your data is where the value is, right? There's a tremendous amount of proprietary data that manufacturers have that you, you could potentially monetize either through internal use cases or external. And so just keep in mind that uh, using or kind of uh, leveraging a large language model standalone uh, is interesting, but if you combine it with your proprietary data, it's magic. <laughs> and then the other thing that I would say is um, you have to understand the security of these things. And so I'm going to talk about these two things and then I'll continue with the learnings. So just remember, here's here's the thought that you need to keep in the back of your head. You need to combine the foundation model with your domain data to really be valuable. But what's interesting is, is that the more domain data you have, the less, the less um, high end the foundation model you need. So it seems like what we're learning, and I'll talk about it in just a second, seems like what we're learning um, is that there are options um, for which foundation model is best uh, based on these combining technologies. So let me talk about protecting intellectual property for a second because your domain data is valuable because it's proprietary, nobody else has it. So in order to protect this, if you are combining your data with a public or open source foundation model, it's pretty straightforward. Because it's public, you can take that foundation model, take a copy of it, put it inside your account, you know, combine it and then it's all protected in your account. If, however, you're using a proprietary foundation model, right? And there are model builders um, out there who have great models, right? But if you're using a proprietary foundation model, you need to think about this as almost like an escrow account where you need to have the ability to take a copy of their foundation model, 
but they're not going to want you to see the proprietary information of their foundation model. So you have to put it in this escrow account. And the same way, you need to bring your domain data into an escrow account. And the mechanism that you're building this needs to be able to do the work within the escrow account without letting the intellectual property leak out either way. Right, so pay close attention in this area. Um, and uh, we're happy to, you know, explain further and dive uh, deeper uh, in this area for you. So if we go back to these learnings, there's a there's a lot of interesting learnings um, coming out in the last uh, eight months or so. So um, what I would say is first and foremost is probably you need to build up some expertise in this and learn about it because it is an emerging technology. Um, and so you need to kind of just, you know, create organizational muscle and start experimenting. And so you understand how to, um, you know, operate better. This includes including your legal team, <laughs> by the way, uh, especially if you have external use cases, getting your legal team involved early so they understand how these models respond, behave, how you can control them, how you can protect your intellectual property, et cetera. The legal team will need to take a look at that. Um, so, um, you know, don't uh, wait to the last minute because otherwise you'll find that your timeline maybe triples if you introduce the, the concept and, and, you know, the answer without early legal review. So I want to cover a few of these things, right? Um, and then we can, you can always um, reach out to me individually for more information as it makes sense. Um, the first one is, um, so like you saw in previous presentations, right, with, um, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, my my colleagues uh, or uh, our customers speaking. Um, there is a lot of good AI ML technology that's already out there. And so one lesson that I want to highlight is don't think of generative AI as a complete magic button, right? It doesn't solve all problems. It's not like, you know, the answer to everything. There's a really good report. Again, you have the um, you know, link here when you get the deck, you can read it and I would encourage you to, but this is um, from um, Altman Solon. And they highlight that Gen AI is really good on core, what they call core capabilities, but I want to highlight what, what they say it's not good at, right? And so if you want to do anomaly detection as an example, um, uh, you know, where uh, as an example through Monotron or look out for equipment, use those technologies. They're already established. They're, they do a great job. You don't need to try to throw that into Gen AI. Um, so that's the first thing, be aware. The second thing that I'd like to call out is there is definitely a trade-off on quality, cost, and performance or latency, right? And so right now, everybody's focused on the quality of models, but not on how much it costs to get the quality. And so I think what we're seeing from our customers is as they experiment with combining domain data with different foundation models, some cost more than others, that um, you know which model is best tends to be a shifting target. And so here are a few factors. So, so one is what the best model is, is dynamic anyway, right? And so um, you know, when uh, you know, uh, OpenAI's uh, chat GPT based uh, you know, the, the, the thing that ChatGPT is based on was the, you know, their um, uh, 3.5 uh, GPT model, right? It was good. And then you had something like Anthropic Cloud come out and it was good or better. And now you had somebody else come out and then you have another one, right? And so take, keep, keep an eye on the leaderboards, both from a proprietary model builders leaderboard, uh, which is on the left here, as well as open source uh, or publicly available models, which is um, on the Hugging Face. Hugging Face is a, um, a company that evangelizes open source uh, you know, ML. And so they have a great open source leaderboard. So keep an eye on that. Um, we get a lot of questions on which model is best. And um, I think I would refer you to Stanford University's Helm site. So Helm is holistic evaluation of large uh, language models, excuse me. And um, so they have, uh, they compare these models. And so it's another way to look at a leaderboard. But I think if you go to this site and you click on um, the results, what you'll find is, is they organize the, uh, and the evaluation and the results based on what use you're putting the model to. Right, and so it could be that question and answering 
versus uh, summarization has different answers. So this is a particularly interest one, interesting one to keep an eye on. Um, and there's lots of other information that I could share, but unfortunately I'm keeping an eye on time and I wanna leave room for plenty of questions and answers. So um, I'll leave this point and move on to some recommendations I'd make. So here, here are some recommendations. So one is if you wanna build institutional uh, you know, muscle in this area. Um, think about it as a democratization process. So I would create a sandbox and don't worry so much about productionalizing it because it's going to be internal use. So you can use the sandbox to quickly iterate on high value concepts, right? If you want to test out things, it's, you can, you can test these things out really quickly, right? It's, it's not months and months of uh, projects to see if there's value, it's weeks uh, or days. Um, but one of the real uh, tricks on unlocking uh, value is, and I've seen really successful customer, or, you know, real, real success from customers who do this, is create an internal demo showcase, right? So, so you know, put this sandbox, make it available to the business users as, as well as, you know, IT or data science and let them test it, capture their feedback, right? Automate the gathering of feedback, right? So if you, if you think about it, you can, you can capture what their question is, you can capture what the answer is, and then if you provide a little button that says, was this feedback good or not? And if they say yes, capture that information too, and that's a whole host of learnings and uh, something that you can use further on. But if you, if you expose the internal line of business, you know, domain experts, the business users to this technology, you will quickly learn a lot. Um, highly recommend, you know, running towards internal use cases and testing there um, and walk slowly towards external ones. This is, this is immensely critical to get your legal teams and risk teams involved first. Um, again, this is uh, emerging capabilities uh, and we need to understand behavior from, you know, from your company standpoint, you need to understand the behavior of these things, including your legal representative, because they can't advise you on risk if they don't understand behavior. Um, okay, and so um, keep testing. Uh, and then um, think about it, think about automating your testing. And so marketing uh, groups have known for years how to do what's called A-B testing. Right, so some users get, get option A, some users get option B, and then they can compare the results. So you can actually do this. Um, we uh, ran um, our code assistant, Code Whisperer, through um, about a year's worth of internal testing uh, before we released it to the public. Um, and uh, we got great results, but we did formal A-B testing too, where we gave the same assignments to you know, different groups, and then we were able to compare how fast the code assistant accelerated development of one um, code assignment uh, based on different people having it and not. So you can do this with all of the generative AI in that internal um, sandbox and really learn from that. Um, happy to answer questions on this. Um, let me kind of wrap up by um, talking about a few things. So one is um, AWS has a philosophy around generative AI uh, as well as other things. And so our philosophy is we wanna give you choice and provide flexibility. So that means we support um, both proprietary large language models as well as open source. We um, provide support for different personas, whether you're a data scientist or a, you know, a developer with no data science expertise. Um, so, uh, like many things, you know, AWS, this is true for generative AI as well. We always consider um, security uh, like the, you know, the, the foundation of everything. And so, um, you know, we talked earlier about how to protect intellectual property. We support that, uh, those opaque or escrow accounts for generative AI um, to, to ensure that your intellectual property is protected. Um, we definitely want, want to have the most cost-effective or price-performing infrastructure. Um, and then really our customers always ask us, can you make it easier to build these things? Um, and so we'll talk about how we do that. 
And then we're going to roll out generative AI everywhere, but I want to highlight four things since uh, we have limited time. So one is for flexibility and choice uh, and in a secure environment, um, we have two um, ways you can uh, build Gen AI applications. So one of them is um, we have Amazon Bedrock, which has gotten a lot of press lately. This is a, a large language model and agent functionality wrapped up in an API, right? So if you're not a data scientist, you can still take advantage of it um, very easily with just an API call and you can embed it in your applications uh, and enhance their uh, value. So I would encourage you to kind of take a look at Amazon Bedrock. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're a data scientist and want more control or need more control, if you wanna continue fine tuning because you have a large amount of monetizable data, if you wanna create your own uh, large language model, um, or, or if you just you know need to be able to use um, open source models, we have uh, a part of Amazon SageMaker, which is our managed service for developing machine learning applications. Think about it to use a, a manufacturing example. SageMaker is a high-speed assembly line for developing AI and ML. So um, there's a part of SageMaker and SageMaker Jumpstart that has a foundation model hub. So this is where you'll find a whole lot of open source or publicly available models. You'll find other, other models besides Gen AI there as well. So if you need more control and have that expertise, you can leverage it there. I'll bring up a couple of uh, infrastructure services because I think they're really important. So we design our own chips specifically to be highly efficient at machine learning workloads. And so I'll highlight the Trainium uh, chip as well as the Inferentia 2 chip. And so um, the, these are just uh, really the best price performance um, you know, infrastructure to run machine learning on. And so um, you know, reach out to us and we can explain further, but they're designed from the ground up for efficiency in both training and in inference. And then finally, um, one example, a very powerful example of a generative AI powered solution, right, is our code assistant, which is Amazon Code Whisper. Um, you know, internally, when we used it, we found on average a 57% improvement uh, in speed of development with no drop off in quality. Uh, and so that's a, that's a heck of a, a you know, efficiency accelerator um, lever. Uh, for everyone to use, given how much software development we all do. So here's my recommendation. Um, one, go take a look at Amazon Code Whisper immediately, right? It's, uh, you know, you know, if you can get 50% improvement in development speed, that's, that's going to be worth a lot. Um, I would highly recommend you to build institutional knowledge, build, build muscle uh, around, um, you know, understanding how to embed these uh, foundation models in your processes. Do that through taking a look at Amazon Bedrock or, or SageMaker uh, Jumpstart if you need to. And to get started, I would highly encourage you to just start doing POCs. Um, but if you need help, um, one of our leaders publicly announced a month or so ago that we've got a $100 million investment in a Gen AI Innovation Center to help you do this. And so um, would highly encourage you to uh, reach out to us and explore um, how our Expert Innovation Center um, can help you kind of learn uh, and progress. So I've covered a lot of stuff. Um, I think it's time for a Q&A, so I'll pause and see what questions you have. Thanks, Danny. Uh, we have a few questions here. I'll take the one from Faraz first. Can you imagine GPTs being deployed on edge to utilize the data available locally? Would that enable manufacturers to provide tailored experience to individual users? Um, yeah, we have customers experimenting uh, with this. And so the question on, on edge always is, you know, do you have enough compute at the edge uh, do you have a tight enough package uh, to run inference? Uh, and so I think uh, I would say from a practical answer, the jury's still out. We have a lot of people experimenting. And so if you're experimenting, I'd love to um, spend time with you, hear your thoughts and see what you're looking at. 
Um, but we do have a lot of interest, especially from industrial customers, right? Because there's so much edge uh, stuff. Um, with that being said, um, uh, you know, uh, there's not a lot of data being moved back and forth if we're referring to like large language models specifically, right? Uh, you know, using like cloud infrastructure for, for an endpoint, um, calling an endpoint, getting a response back. So, um, you know, it would have to depend on latency of the, you know, needs of the use case. And then if there's uh, available bandwidth in and out of the edge uh, facility uh, or device, if you will. So I think there's a lot of what ifs and it depends. And uh, sorry, I can't be more specific, but happy to spend more time with you and talk about some of the details. A uh, lot of interest, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of public um, uh, engagement or public stories yet uh, at the moment, but happy to spend more time and talk about it in detail. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Sameet. Currently, most generative AI solutions are human level lat latency sensitive and may not fit the machine level latency sensitive applications, such as credit card fraud detection. Do you see latency being a limitation for solutions in future and as a consideration for adoption in the manufacturing use cases? Um, so it, depend it depends on use case, of course. Um, but um, what I have not seen is enough understanding, broadly speaking, of how these technologies can be fully automated, right? And so I haven't seen a lot of customers want to let the let a, a generative AI application um, directly control the manufacturing process, as an example, without a human in the loop around things like large language models and stuff. We, we have seen like those other Gen AI technologies, you know, generative adversarial networks. It, it, the concept is like you pit one model against each other to try to improve. And so we have seen, um, you know, GAN, um, you know, uh, AI techniques kind of used for set point optimization kind of in a, in a similar way to how reinforcement learning has used, has been used for set point optimization. And so there we've seen, we, we've had good success um, and not had latency problems, but it all depends on the process and how fast you need. So definitely something that uh, you need to consider. Um, with that being said, there's also a lot, a tremendous amount of work uh, in the, uh, the public or open source community around how to get tighter models, smaller models that provide good results with, um, uh, you know, with a, a, a reduced latency impact. So I think it's early days yet. And so we'll continue to see improvements uh, that we can take advantage of. Thank you. Thank you for presenting today.